Good morning, everybody. Today, I'll be presenting uh, our work, Listen to Your Key, towards acoustics-based physical key inference. This work was jointly done with Harini Ramprasad and my advisor, Junhan, at the National University of Singapore. So, physical locks and keys are primarily used to secure doors and mailboxes. The basic working principle consists of a lock and a matching key, which is used to unlock this lock. So, if you see the secret embedded in this key itself, it's actually present in the shape of this key, where it has these cuts of different depths, which are actually the secret. And they're commonly referred to as key biddings. But are these physical locks and key systems really secure? One of the pop most popular ways to you know, compromise the security of these systems is lock picking, where a set of specialized tools are being inserted into the keyway of the lock, which manipulate the lock's internal components in order to unlock them. But if you think from an attacker's perspective, this has certain disadvantages. Firstly, it involves active manipulation for the attacker to do, which means the attacker requires tools and expertise. And also, because the attack takes few seconds to a few minutes to completely launch, it quickly raises suspicion. Also, because the attack primarily focuses on locks as opposed to keys, you don't really get the secret of the key or the bidding information. And hence, the attacker only gets a single time entry to the facility. Hence, we ask the question as to whether we can infer the secret of the key or the key biddings without any active manipulation. So in order to answer this question, we look into the process of key insertion itself. So every process of key insertion or withdrawal is always ac accompanied by a certain sound, which sounds like this. Okay. Yeah. So, and this sound produces actually an uh, inevitable consequence of the process of key insertion itself. So the question we try to pose is whether an attacker who is probably walking around in your corridor with a smartphone microphone and captures the sound of your key insertion, can he actually be able to infer the key biddings or the secret of this particular key? Okay. So in this talk, I'll actually be showing you that this is indeed feasible. So before we go on to our uh, technique, I'll briefly talk to you about how the locks actually work and what's the internal components. So within every lock are these two sets of pins called top pins and bottom pins. In the locked state, the, the top pins are actually blocking this red line that you can see there, which prevents the lock from rotating. So when the right key or the matching key is being inserted into the lock, the two sets of pins actually align at this particular red line, which kind of makes rotation possible. Okay. So now I kind of discuss some of the terminologies I'll be using in the rest of the talk. One thing we ought to know is biddings, which are the ac actual secret of the key. These are six in number in this particular key, and they are essentially depths of different cuts. Sorry, cuts of different depths. So each of these depths actually take one of many discrete values, which are generally notated from zero onwards till nine, a total of 10 depth values. And the distance between every two adjacent depths is called increment, which is generally in the order of 10th of a millimeter. So if you look at the very first bidding position B1, you can see that it exactly aligns with a particular line, which gives it a value three. And the second bidding position aligns with the deepest cut, giving it a value nine. So on, you can get the values for the rest of the bidding positions. So this six digit number, 393597, is what actually represents the secret of this particular key. And this is what we want to infer from the acoustic recording. Okay. So there are also these interesting components in a key, which are these ridges, are these edgy intersections between any two bidding positions. And these are very crucial for us because they are, res they are the ones which are responsible for the production of sound during key insertion. So a simple way for you to remember these terms is you can think of ridges as mountains and bittings as valleys within the key. So another important number to talk about at this juncture is the key space. So because we have six cut positions and 10 possible values for each, the key space should ideally be 10 par six, but in reality, it's actually close to half of that. And this is because of additional constraints imposed by manufacturers where they kind of eliminate certain trivial codes, which are easy to duplicate on site. So now that we understand the lock mechanism, I'll quickly talk to you about what exactly causes the sound as the sound key is being inserted. So if you look at a zoomed in view of the key, you can um, kind of see these you know, pins as well as these ridges being very pointed. And because of that pointed nature, every time this pin falls off the ridge of the key, it produces a very sharp tone or a click sound. So maybe I can you know, go through an animation where you can kind of visualize this. So as the key is being inserted, every time it falls off, you kind of hear a click sound. Okay, so I can play it again. So click and then falls. Okay. So in order to show you that these clicks are in fact real and 
they form the majority of the sound produced during key insertion. I show a real spectrogram of a key insertion here. So spectrogram basically shows you energies of different frequencies as it changes with time. So the bottom plot here tells you what is the ground truth of expected click timestamps for a particular key insertion. And you can kind of see that there is a correspondence between the onsets of clicks that you see in the spectrogram with that of the expected ground truth. So, so far we've kind of, I've kind of explained to you how the lock works and what really causes the sound when the key is being inserted. So now we kind of switch gears and show how we can make use of the sound that's being generated to actually infer the secret of the key or the key biddings. So this is where I introduce to you our work, which is Spy Key. So the basic design of Spy Key is as follows. So what do you do is you first capture the audio recording of a particular victim's key's insertion. And from this, you extract a series of clicks that you can detect on the audio time series. From that, we find out what we call is the you know, distance between ridges, which is the inter-ridge distance of the ridges in the key. And this can kind of give us in partial information about the bittings, which are the secrets in the key. With this partial information, we kind of reduce the possible key search space, which ultimately gives us a set of candidate keys, of which one of them corresponds to the victim key, which was initially recorded. Okay? So first, let me briefly tell you about what this click time series is. So let's consider a single pin and see what happens as the key is being inserted. Okay? So for each ridge the pin contacts, it produces a click sound. right? So as it encounters the six different ridges, the first pin produces a total of six clicks. right? So similarly, for the second pin, we get a series of five clicks because the second pin can never really encounter the last ridge of the key. So two key observations to make here. One, the second pin pattern is very similar to that of the first because both of them go through the same ridges. And also there's a certain offset for the second pin time series. And this is because of the time taken by the key to move between two pins, okay, which we call the pin time interval. So similarly, you can imagine for the third pin, you get four clicks, you get three clicks for the fourth pin, so on till the sixth pin, you get like a decreasing number of clicks. And this is totally a um, total of 21 clicks. So what I've done here is kind of dissected the clicks according to the different pins. But what you would see in reality is like an interleaved version of all these clicks together. So from an audio time series, what you can really extract is these 21 clicks without being able to differentiate which click belongs to which pin. right? So as a first step, what we do is to obtain the time series corresponding only to a single pin because the rest of the pins are redundant information. So if we have this 21 clicks, what we first do is compute the pin time interval and shift the same series by this pin time interval. So now what really happens is for all clicks of pins from two onwards till six in the first time series, there is a corresponding click in the bottom uh, time series. So because of this, what happens is when you subtract the second from the first, you kind of get rid of all the clicks from the second pin onwards till the sixth pin. Okay, And this kind of gives you the clicks only corresponding to the first pin. So now that we have this, let's try to see how we can infer something about the key, which is the inter-ridge distance. So the information that we really have is the time at which the pin strikes the different ridges. And what we really need is the distance between these ridges and the key. Okay, So clearly, you can kind of see a mapping between the time interval between clicks and the distance between ridges. And they're kind of related by a you know, simple distance equals speed times time interval formula. Okay. One key thing to observe here is that we have an assumption that the insertion speed of the key itself is consistent. Um, however, we don't expect to be knowing that value, which and we can actually compute the speed, which I will be skipping for time constraints. So now that we have the interridge distances, how do we infer the key bittings, which is actually the secret of the key? So to reiterate, what we have is the distance between edges and ridges in the key. And what we really desire is the depth of these different cuts, which is the bittings. Unfortunately, there's no direct mapping between interridge distances and the key bittings itself. Uh, so what we kind of do is introduce an intermediate step where we compute what we call as the triplet bidding sum. So this triplet bidding sum is essentially a function of three adjacent bidding positions. So instead of directly giving you information about the bidding value itself, it, what you get is a function of many bidding positions together. Okay. So before we go on to this triplet bidding sum, first let's try to understand the relationship between interridge distances and biddings, which are the key secrets. Okay. So let's consider a particular key and focus on the first three bidding positions. Okay? In this case, the values are three, four, and nine. Now, if we consider a different key, 
which has a, a different third bidding position, okay, five in this case, you can see that there's also a shift in the position of the ridge as the bidding value changed, right? So now if you look at a different key which has a different third bidding position, again the pos value of the ridge changed with the change in the bidding position. So what's really happening is that because the cut angle or the angle at a bidding position remains consistent from key specifications, every change in the bidding value is actually affecting the ridge position as well, okay? So because the ridge position is changing, you can also see how the inter-ridge distance is consistently increasing for the three different keys, okay? So the key takeaway from this slide is the change in bidding value is in fact affecting the inter-ridge distance. So now we're ready to define what we call as the triplet bidding sum, which is a function of three adjacent bidding positions. So for example, you can take it for the first three bidding positions, B1, B2, and B3. You can define it as the sum of two bidding differences, B2 minus B1 and B2 minus B3. So if we go back to our previous example of the three different keys, clearly we understand that the interest distance is consistently increasing for the three keys, okay? So for this case, if we also compute the triplet bidding sum, you can see that for the first key, it's gonna be four minus three, plus four minus nine from the you know, first three bidding positions. This gives you a value minus four. So similarly, you get the values for key two as well as key three. And what you're kind of observing is that there's a similar increasing trend in the triplet bidding sum as you see in the interlitch distances. In fact, what is uh, true is that there is always a correlation between these interlitch distances and what we call the triplet bidding sum. And what is more interesting is that these um, two quantities are actually linearly related, okay? Which means given the interest distance value, you can already find the triplet bidding sum. So now that we compute the triplet bidding sum for one particular triplet, we can similarly compute this value for all possible uh, triplets. And what this essentially gives you is a set of four equations where you know the values of the triplet bidding sums and you have six unknowns, which are the bidding positions itself. So given this particular triplet bidding sequence, we now show you how you can obtain a set of candidate keys. So what we really want to know is the six different bidding values. So because we have more unknowns than equations, we try to fix the value of the first two bidding positions. So let's say we fix it to B3, 9, for example. You can already deterministically compute B3 because S2 is related to B1, B2, and B3, and you already know the values for the remaining variables. So on finding B3, you can similarly find the values of the rest of the bidding positions as well. So of all the values we get, we only retain the valid quotes such that the values lie between zero and nine for all bidding positions. So ultimately what Spikey returns to you is a set of candidate keys for each audio recording of which one of them corresponds to the right victim key. So now we go on to the simulation results where we um, you know, perform this for uh, 330,000 keys, which is actually a subset of the total key space. So what we ideally desire is the number of candidate keys we get for the different input keys. So for each of these keys, you can imagine as a particular key K1 is being inserted, um, you, on collecting the audio recording and passing it to Spikey, you get three candidate keys. So similarly for K2, you might get four candidate keys. For K3, you get three candidate keys and so on. You find for all possible 330,000 keys in the key space. And what is interesting here is that the maximum number of keys you can get for any possible key insertion is just 15 keys. And the most frequent keys you get just three candidate keys. So if you think about this, like most of, some of us might already have three keys in our key bunch. And if an attacker is get, just getting three candidate keys, you can imagine how um, scary such an attack could be. So I think I'm running short of time, so I'll probably uh, skip discussion. So to conclude, the, um, our work, Spikey, is providing like an acoustic analysis of the process of key insertion itself, and we show how we can leverage this sound to infer key biddings. And we also come up with a technique which can minimize suspicion and lower the attacker's effort in comparison to uh, lock picking. And through simulation, we show how we can reduce the key space to about three keys in the most frequent case. Thank you.